Good evening, everyone. We're getting ready to start the program. First, I'd just like to welcome everyone to our first annual Life is a Journey Community Education Program. My name is Kelly Fisher, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Journey Care. This past weekend, you may have heard the news that former First Lady Barbara Bush decided to change the pathway for her care and not seek aggressive medical care, but to seek comfort care. Everyone's talking about it. It's all over Facebook. Every day, Journey Care serves more than 3,000 patients in our community with comfort care measures through a variety of programs that are patient-centered and have a team approach with social workers, certified CNAs, chaplains, volunteers. I want to make sure I don't forget anybody. Our um, physicians and bereavement counseling. Very big team approach. And we serve these patients whether they live in a private residence, in community living, or in one of our community care centers spread out through our 10 county regional service area. The news of Barbara Bush actually gives us time to take pause and think about are we having conversations at home? And what are those conversations? Are we asking the right questions? Are we considering what we should do for advanced directives? Do we know what to do for advanced directives? Just stop and think for a moment. If you were unable to make a decision for yourself, have you chosen someone who could make that decision for you? Do you have confidence in them? Do they have confidence in themselves to act on your behalf? Are they comfortable making decisions if there are more than one decision to be made? And do they know that you actually chose them for this very important job? And better yet, do they really understand what your goals and wishes are? This is why Journey Care believes community education is so important. And events like this, Life is a Journey, are critical in helping us to get comfortable with the conversation at all ages and at all times in our lives. And we're excited about it. So I'm going to let you know if you haven't actually started that advanced directive in your goodie bag, we have some information along with the book. So we're very excited to share that with you as well. Without further ado, I'd like to turn your attention to the screen so that you can hear from Sarah Boberka, our CEO, who is unfortunately unable to attend tonight but that's because she's on her honeymoon in Italy with her new husband, Dave. So, Sarah wanted to make sure she had a few words. Good evening, and welcome everyone to our first Life is a Journey annual community education series. My name is Sarah Boberka, President and CEO of Journey Care. We could not be more thrilled for tonight's discussion. First, let me give my personal thanks to Ride for three reasons. Bob Lee, Thank you for your visionary effort and passion to help communities, families, and individuals understand hospice care and the value of advanced care planning. Bob's organization, Ride for Three Reasons, raised funds for this cause. Your passion is infectious. Two years ago, a then 17-year-old Jan was inspired to get involved and make a difference. These efforts raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, so this day could be made possible allowing Journey Care to bring an annual community education event like tonight for another three to five years. To our donors and board members, whose enduring support of our mission to enrich lives helps us provide a range of supportive and specialized care for adults and children living with serious and life-limiting illnesses. Your support allows us to care for everyone in need, regardless of their means. Your unwavering commitment and deep felt compassion are beyond words. And to tonight's event sponsors, a special thanks to Kim Dushiswa, Debbie Wadmore, and again, Ride for Three Reasons. B 
Because of you, every attendee will receive a complimentary copy of the book, When Breath Becomes Air, along with the underwriting of tonight's delicious hors d'oeuvres and beverages. And to our media sponsor, Comcast Spotlight, thank you for helping us get the word out. Now to our special guest, Lucy Kalanithi. Welcome to Chicago, and thank you for accepting our invitation to share your story without hesitation. To our esteemed moderators, thanks to our board member, Elise Majors, for agreeing to moderate tonight's fabulous event, along with her husband, former ABC News anchor, Ron Majors. Now, I invite you to all sit back and celebrate Life is a Journey. Thank you. As Sarah mentioned, we could not be more thrilled about having our esteemed panel with us tonight. I'm just going to share a little bit of information about our moderators, Elise and Ron, and a little bit about Lucy. Elise Majors joined the Journey Care Board of Directors in 2017. As the assistant director of, I'm going to struggle on this, Ron, Repug, can you help me, Elise? Replogal, Replogal, thank you. Um, the Center for Counseling and Wellbeing, she has been a pastoral psychotherapist and an administrator working with individuals and adults and couples for over 30 years. After studying with marital experts and researchers, she developed and leads the premarital Saturday seminars at the Fourth Presbyterian Church, where the center is located. Elise has earned a master's degree from McCormick Theological Seminary and Loyola University of Chicago with postdoctorate graduate training in a variety of disciplines. And she, like I, we don't um, like having our pictures taken or talking too much, but um, we have great smiles and, and we're so happy to be here tonight. Ron Majors, her husband, is in the Chicago Emmy Awarding Journalist. He is an, an Emmy Awarding Journalist. And from 1998 until he retired in 2016, he co-anchored the top five rated 5 p.m. Uh, news broadcast for ABC Chicago, Channel 7. Prior to his time at ABC 7, Ron served as the co-anchor for the evening news at the NBC 5 Chicago. Ron also served for nearly 20 years as a commentator on the Roe Khan show on WLS in the AM. Throughout his esteemed career, Ron has won numerous awards, including six Chicago Emmy Awards. He's also earned awards from the Associated Press and the Illinois Broadcaster Association. But the one that is most significant to him is the award for ethics he received from the National Society for Professional Journalism. And then, finally, we have our guest speaker tonight. Dr. Lucy Kalanithi is the widow of the late Paul, Dr. Paul Kalanithi, author of the book, Number One Times, New York Times bestseller, When Breath Becomes Air. And she wrote the epilogue. As an internal medicine physician and faculty member at Stanford School of Medicine in Palo Alto, California, she completed her medical degree at Yale, where she met Paul, right? Mm -hmm. And where um, she in was inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha National Medical S Honor Society. Her residency at the University of California, San Francisco, and her postdoctorate fellowship training in healthcare delivery innovation at Stanford's Clinical Excellence Research Center was also part of her work. At the cross-section of her career as a medical professional and her personal experiencing uh, standing alongside her husband during his life, diagnosis, treatment, and death, Dr. Kalanithi has special interest in healthcare value, meaning in medicine, patient-centered care, and end-of-life care. She's appeared on PBS NewsHour, NPR Morning Edition, and Yahoo News with Katie Couric, and she's been interviewed by People, NPR, and the New York Times. She currently lives in San Francisco Bay Area with her daughter, Elizabeth Acadia. Please join me in welcoming tonight's panel to the stage.
Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Nice to have you here. I don't know how you could drag yourself away from this endless string of lovely spring evenings. In <laughs> I quite look forward to this event tonight. I think it's an extremely important discussion about this book, When Breath Becomes Air, a lyrical novel, if ever there was one. We had the great good fortune to be reading something written by a man who dared to face his own end and share it with us in a way that was extremely moving for me. Paul Kalanithi was a neurosurgeon and writer. Graduated from Stanford with a BA and an MA in English literature and a BA in human biology. I feel more inadequate with each sentence. <laughs> well, then he decided to earn a Master's of Philosophy in History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine from the University of Cambridge, then graduated cum laude from the Yale School of Medicine. He returned to Stanford to complete his residency in neurological surgery and a postdoctoral fellowship in neuroscience, during which he received the American Academy of Neurological Surgery's highest award for research. Underachiever. Underachiever. <laughs> yeah. And on top of that, he married well. <laughs> you heard the background of Lucy, who finished the book that Paul so courageously wrote. Lucy was clearly a woman who had her own direction in life, but for her, as it does for many of us, life's direction went away she could not have anticipated. They make no mistake about letting you know what you're going to read with this book. On the opening dust jacket, it says, at the age of 36, on the verge of completing a decade's worth of training as a neurosurgeon, Paul Kalanithi was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. One day, he was a doctor, treating the dying, and the next, he was a patient struggling to live. And just like that, the future he and his wife had imagined evaporated. What did not evaporate was the essential substance of this man in a courageously written book that was finished by Lucy. Yes, indeed. And that in itself was quite courageous, I think, as well, to be able to do that. Um, I, I, when I was prepar preparing for tonight, a quote came to me that I thought was really apropos to um, beginning this conversation. And it's from a book called The Fault in Our Stars. And it's about two people who meet, and they're in their late teens, and they both are quite ill with cancer, and Gus says to Hazel, grief does not change you, Hazel, it reveals you. And that quote struck me because I thought, I wonder how the really hard task of finishing Paul's book and um, writing the epilogue after all that you had been through and then the daunting task of getting it published, which anyone who's done that knows it's not an easy thing to do. And so I was struck that I wonder how this was part of your grief process, and if you could tell us a little about that. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I'm just thinking about how, you know, it's like we're here having this conversation and we're talking about end of life care and we'll talk about advanced care planning and, um, you know, like illness and eventually death are there for all of us. And we know that. But I think grief is too, you know, it's like one of the big things that we do together as human beings is um, lose each other. And it's, I had no idea how painful it would be. And I, I initially I was like, I cannot believe this is a thing that we all have to do. It's mm -hmm. unbelievably painful. Um, and for me, having the book to work on, uh, on Paul's behalf was super sustaining and really helpful, um, you know, initially as a project to work on, having been married to Paul and so close, and then 
together during his illness to have something to continue to do like mm -hmm. for him and like sort of with him, you know, mm -hmm. that we had started this thing, raising our daughters like that. Um, and the book was like that. And then I think for a lot of people, somebody dies and they don't necessarily have a chance to talk about the person in a whole lot of contexts, you know, like um, Sheryl Sandberg wrote about when her husband died and she would be at a, she was at a dinner party and everybody was explaining how they had met their spouse. Like, oh, how did you guys meet? And how did you guys meet? And no one asked her, how did you and Dave meet? But it's like she's carrying around that story, mm -hmm. you know, like she and she's carrying around like all those feelings and the love. And I feel like, you know, sitting here with you tonight, I get to talk about that and talk about Paul in a way that teaches me something about how to approach somebody else who's grieving, you know, just okay. to, um, so I don't know, it, but it's been, um, and for the first year after Paul died, I, I was like a, a little bit insane. Like I was functioning, but I had these really strange physical symptoms. Like my hands were tingling and burning all the time. Like it was very, very intense. So, um, Grief revealed burn, tingling and burning in my hands. That's for sure. <laughs> um, you know, and it also, but I also feel like it reveals like um, your community, right? And your, the vulnerability of other people around you. Like I feel, and especially Paul, you know, we both wrote about our marriage being on the rocks for this period of time. Now I know everything about other people's marriages. <laughs> it's like the depth of the relationships that I have or the things people tell me and the things I people understand I'm willing to talk about is like deeper and richer, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's just been um, terrible and wonderful at the same time. Wow. So how did you and Paul meet? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it's their 43rd wedding anniversary today. <laughs> so I think maybe we should hear like a sentence or two about how you met too. Or like you definitely loved her first. <laughs> you did. Like. Um, we were uh, first year students at Yale in medical school. And um, so everybody's like meeting each other at, you know, at the beginning of school. And I knew Paul was smart and sort of cerebral because you could just sort of tell. And then I realized that in his medical student ID, he was wearing a fake mustache. This was <laughs> crazy. It was like insane. It was insane. And um, he had been a comedy writer in college and stepped up to get the photo taken. And I don't even know why. I think just to be absurd, but also because he was like, okay, I'm on this cusp where I'm gonna to have to become serious, you know, like I'm gonna be a medical student, you have to be serious. And then became very serious, you know, and like this is a whole, he was very serious in the way that he was in the book. It was exactly who he was. But he also had this really irreverent, funny, other, a, a different way of being alive side. Um, so he wore this fake mustache in his med school ID. And as soon as I, as soon as I saw that, I was like, that guy is crazy and um, <laughs> like really full of these contradictions and just really appealing and interesting. And um, then we got, I won a raffle to get to go on a date with him. It was, it was <laughs> for a fundraiser. For a I love that fundraiser. part of your story. <laughs> got lucky. Very lucky. Uh, you know, among the things that, that really interested me uh, about Paul and the way he wrote about his terminal diagnosis was he had long expressed an interest in life issues and even in in death. So he he faced patients who were going through this very same thing. Yet I, I was stunned to read that that when it came to him, there was no map. He he yeah. he was lost for a while. Uh, he 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 said. My life had been building potential that would now go unrealized. I had planned to do so much, I had come so close. I was physically debilitated. My imagined future and my personal identity collapsed. I faced the same existential quandaries my patient faced. The lung cancer diagnosis was confirmed. My carefully planned and hard-won future no longer existed. Death, so familiar to me in my work, was now paying a personal visit. Here we were, finally, face to face, and yet nothing about it seemed recognizable. Standing at the crossroads where I should have been able to see and follow the footprints of countless patients I had treated over the years, I saw instead only a blank, a harsh, vacant, gleaming white desert as if a sandstorm 
had erased all trace of familiarity. I'm almost stunned by that. I would think as a physician, it's preparing you for that moment. Yeah, um, I think there are kind of a couple of things behind that. Um, you know, Paul had studied history and philosophy of science and medicine and then surprised himself by entering medical practice, like moving more and more toward direct experience, right? Um, instead of just like the big um, philosophical conceptual ideas about meaning and mortality. He's like, I want to be right there. Um, so he becomes a neurosurgeon, dealing with people all the time who are gravely ill or making these critical decisions or dying themselves. Um, but the really striking thing when he was diagnosed, I think, uh, were a couple of things. One, that, like, no matter how many times you've sat with somebody or helped somebody or witnessed somebody, when it's you, it just is different. And then I think a piece of it is tied up in what he's saying there and what he says a number of times in the book about my future evaporated, I, you know, who am I now? And um, it was so interesting to see, you know, there's like the challenge of facing your own mortality and then the uncertainty around your prognosis and how long you have left, but the massive upheaval in identity that came like the moment of the diagnosis, you realize how much of your future, how much of your identity is tied up in your future self, like who you expect that you will be. Um, and I think in a way that piece of it was as disorienting as anything else, you know, like whether it's a terminal illness or a disability or aging or whatever, it's like these real fluxes in your, in your, in your identity. Um, so I don't know. I think some of it was just like as the experience becomes more and more direct, um, it becomes like so purely emotional and visceral, right? Like in a way your intellectual tools don't help you until you can rebuild and like figure, get your feet back on the ground. And I think that was part of why writing the book ended up being so helpful. Like Paul had left the academy to become a physician and, and you know, be right there at these critical moments. And then when he himself became sick, he immediately reached for literature and writing. It was like, how do I put words on this thing? How do I, how do I make sense of this? Um, Cause it was so disorienting, like you said, it was like, it was shocking to see that. And I think it was the mortality and just the pure fact. It's like, you're not actually somebody different from who you were yesterday, but you totally are like your entire conception of who you are and what to expect in your life is completely different suddenly. Well, and he wrote an article for the New York Times mm -hmm. um, called, um, what is it? How long have I got? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, that was that one of his early attempts at trying to make sense mm -hmm. and meaning out of all of this? And do you think that was helpful to him? Totally. That was exactly that. Um, he wrote, he was on an airplane actually. He was back at work at that time on a really promising treatment. Um, that worked for about a year, um, and he wrote he wrote out this essay, and it, it's yeah, how long have I got left? And it was about um, uncertainty and prognosis, and you know what you're hoping your doctor could tell you, and what they no matter what can't tell you. Um, and he sent the essay to two friends and said, you know, do I think I, I could publish this anywhere? This is how the book came about, actually. Um, and one of the friends wrote back and said, like, this essay's okay, and it's like not, you know, you're trying to say four different things, and you buried the lead, and it's like, it needs a lot of work. <laughs> and well, you know about that. Like his, <laughs> this is like his best friend who's hyper-competitive with him. And, <laughs> and the other one wrote back and said, I forwarded this straight to the op-ed desk at the New York Times. And then they published it like a month later. It was great. It was like a dream come true. Dream come true. Um, and he, and it was really widely shared online and he got all these letters from patients and physicians and um, that happened with one other essay he wrote. Then he got a book agent and Random House bought the book and it was like the whole last year of his life when he was too sick to be working as a neurosurgeon, he turned into a writer and it was so sustaining. It was so, um, for all the reasons we just talked about and because, you know, he was becoming sicker and sicker but he was engaged in and contributing to the world of ideas, you know, and feeling like 
this thing would outlast him mm -hmm. um, potentially. So to have a new baby at that time and to have the manuscript for the book became like these new, um, just really life-giving things that happened at the time. Um, but yeah, writing was really helpful. And it was a communication tool in our marriage too. Um, just like I was reading the manuscript as he wrote it. And then we would talk about it like every day or every week. Um, Cause some of this stuff, it's really hard to say out loud, you know, but if, again, if we could kind of talk around mm -hmm. the ideas, mm -hmm. um, that was really helpful. And, and at the same time, Paul was really direct in some instances, like when he was first, literally the day he was diagnosed, he said, I want you to remarry after I die. I just want you to know that. Oh, and it was like, we had to like, we just understood this news. We looked at the CT scan and I was like, I can't believe he's saying that to me. It's so, that is so, that's a crazy thing to hear from your spouse, obviously. But he's saying like in the one sentence, he's like, I'm acknowledging what's ha actually happening. I'm saying that I care about you, like this is happening to me, but I care about you too. And then he's saying like, and I am going to say it, like, I'm going to, I'm willing to say it. And I'm, you know, like it just was, and then it was just radically permissive to me. You know, I can hear him all the time, like telling me I'm doing a good job. And it just was so, so nice. Um, you know, but it's, I, I don't know. Can you imagine saying that? It's just like, wow. I, I, I don't know that I would ever have the courage Paul exhibits, but I think there are some real life things that I would like to learn from the book. One of the things you have said since the book is that you've quoted a survey that says, mm -hmm. facing a terminal diagnosis, 55% of doctors will paint a rosier picture than the facts would dictate. How did you yeah. deal with your doctors and how am I gonna deal with mine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. <laughs> <laughs> you have a healthcare advocate right here. Um, yeah, so this is a big deal. I mean, the the being a physician, having been on the other side of it too, the same taboos that are outside the hospital are inside the hospital too. Um, and I think there's one of the things that I think is not helpful although it's lovely, is the battle metaphor, you know? And in cancer especially, it's like the battle is the only way people ever talk about it. Like, you're gonna fight this, you're gonna beat this, we're gonna overcome it. He lost his battle, he succumbed. It's just like, oh, it's all like battle, battle. And then somehow it's like, if you, if you, you know, if you didn't fight hard, it like, what is that even about? Um, and, but I think that language like doesn't help, you know, I think, um, I think in sometimes you really have to push your doctor, like you just really do, to say, I really want to know what you think is most likely to happen. And I know you can't, you know, Paul writes in the book, those doctors who say you have 11 months to live, you're talking about the median, half of people less, half of people more. You have no idea where you are <laughs> on that. But oftentimes a doctor will have a sense of, you know, most people with this illness live a few months to a few years. That's like a lot of information. If you're trying to decide whether you're gonna have a baby with your husband, and that's the information you have, very helpful, you know? Like, that helps you know what's going on, helps your family know what's going on, helps you understand your resources you need. So I think oftentimes you really, we have to push our doctors to be doing that. And then I think, you know, in medicine, there are, there's great science, there's all kinds of options. So now for almost every disease you have, whether it's getting a knee replacement or you're critically ill toward the end of your life or you know, whatever it might be, there's many options. And so I think having a sense, having your healthcare providers know who you are and what's important to you, and then you understanding what the options are and what they really are, like how much physical therapy and pain it's really gonna take after knee surgery versus not versus whatever. I think um, it's important to find somebody who can like really help you understand the options and um, be clear-headed about them themselves. Um, and I know we're going to talk about advanced directives too, but... Um, well, here's yeah. something that, uh, that makes me think about that you wrote about that um, a pal palliative care team mm -hmm. helped 
you all understand about saying no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I in my line of work, helping people understand what their boundaries are, there are a lot of options and there are a lot of things. And I think um, Joe talked about Barbara Bush. Mm -hmm. I mean, she said no. Yeah. Um, she, I, 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 I think I'll remember her for a long time for that particular lesson under these circumstances. Because uh, given all the options there are and given the chance to be able to decide today for all of us more than we ever could before, um, I, I, I mean, what stood out for you when you learned that? I mean, how did, how did, how did that work for you all? Mm -hmm. um. And it's like Barbara Bush, like she said no to a particular thing. She said yes to another thing, right? She's getting a ton of medical care, but she's, it's all focused on helping her quality of life be as good as it could possibly be right now. Um, it's not like she's not getting medical treatment. And I think that's a thing that's super important to, to know, you know, it's like, um, so I had this patient, I think what you're talking about is I had this patient um, that I saw as an urgent care doctor and she had a really serious illness. She, um, she had to get her nutrition, um, uh, not through her mouth, but through a tube. She had a lot going on. And I said, oh, I see you see the palliative care doctors at Stanford, and how do you like them? And um, palliative care is a medical specialty team that focuses on quality of life. So it's not just for patients who are, have a terminal illness. You could have like Parkinson's or um, really bad emphysema or um, you know, whatever medical illness is causing you stress or, or suffering in some way. And they help deal with symptoms and decisions. Um, and oftentimes they have a whole team that supports your family. They're amazing. All of medicine should be like this. If you could restart and design medicine, you would actually have palliative care be the main part of it. <laughs> and then like some other stuff around. The yes, um, absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it's just like, that's what, that's what like, being well is actually about. So anyways, like, how do you like your palliative care team? And the, this patient said, I love them because they taught me it's okay to say no. And it was super interesting, powerful statement because um, I've talked about this statistic too, but uh, a quarter of people, this all actually seems even low, uh, have either received or seen a loved one received excessive or unwanted medical care. And it's like, we're so specialized. We're so excited about all the things we can do in medicine. And oftentimes it's like, doesn't help or it's too much for somebody or, you know, it's, it literally, it just is okay to say no. And in this survey, they, they were surveying people, you know, about various options. And a lot of people started their answers to the question, well, if I had a choice, I would do X. And that's, isn't that interesting? Like if I had a choice, it's like, we totally have a choice. Um, but it doesn't always feel like that. It feels intimidating. It feels like you can't get the information you need. So I think medical culture is changing for that. And I think um, the baby boomers are going to have a lot to do with that. And there's just all kinds of cultural upheaval that um, I think is going to help us all feel empowered within healthcare and um, to ask for what we need. But I think that idea of if, if I had a choice or um, it's okay to say no is super important. I... I, I... I have a kind of fear about even having that conversation with my doctor. I, I think most of us kind of want to accept what they say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, I, I hear you saying that I have a responsibility to have that conversation, to let that doctor know what my feelings mm -hmm. and thoughts are about all mm -hmm. of this. Did you have that experience? Did you run into spots along Paul's care where Doctors were saying one thing and it was counter to what you intuitively thought you wanted? Um, we had a couple difficult interactions, the, but the main one, I guess there's two. Um, one was um, Paul's doctors, luckily, especially his oncologist and also the palliative care folks, did really pay attention to who he was and what was important. So for people who've read Paul's um, book, when he was first diagnosed and the oncologist was planning his treatment regimen, there was a choice between two different chemo drugs. And one had the side effect of peripheral neuropathy, which is like tingling and numbness in your fingers and toes. And she said, you know, you're a surgeon, so let's not pick that one. Let's do a different one that I think will be fine. And that was this lovely, that was when we first met her. And I was like, I love that she's doing that. And then I think the key, 
the key thing, I mean, this, this wasn't exactly like running up against a decision, but, um, you know, I think we'll talk about advanced directives and what they mean and um, how to think about them. But um, I think one of the most important things when you're thinking about an advanced directive or when you're thinking about making serious medical decisions is to just actually try to figure out what's most important to you, who is most important to you, where is most important to you, what's most important to you in your life. And it, was, it became very clear um, as Paul was getting sicker and kind of just knowing Paul from forever that um, being mentally lucid was the most important thing to him. Um, and it, practically speaking, that meant continuing to write the book. Like that was the thing that he was totally focused on. Um, uh, during the last year of his life, and also being together with me and being with our daughter, um, who was an infant at the time. And so the toughest medical decisions at the end of Paul's life were about things like, okay, I have, um, you know, the cancer has spread to my brain. Am I going to do whole brain radiation or not? Um, am I going to, you know, at the very end, am I going to choose to go on a ventilator? Um, a breathing machine that I might not be able to come off of or not. And that, like, the North Star was like, am I going to be mentally lucid? Like, the, that's, the, that's the thing that will measure the quality of the time I have left. And it was such a strong North Star. It was like, he really knew. Some people, like, I think my mom would say, I really don't want to be in physical pain. I just don't. And please know that about me. <laughs> and like a whole bunch of people are like that. And that is also, it's like super helpful to know. And you can do tons and tons to have that not be the case. It's like, I think having a sense of like who you are in that, uh, across domains like that, where there's a guy, I don't know if you've read Being Mortal by Atul Gawain. I was so just good. thinking about it. Yes. That one yes. guy with like the, the ice cream and the <laughs> football or whatever, he's like, he's like, I'm fine as long as I can eat ice cream and watch football. If I can't be doing those things, I kind of like, that's truly that. I just get me in a position where I can do that. And if I can't do that, we're going to need to talk again. And like, it's just helpful. And so, um, you know, I think, again, there's in medical culture, there's like such a push to, you know, it, assuming that everybody wants like the one particular kind of treatment, wants to go on a breathing machine, and wants to, and it's just like, that, may, that really is not for everybody, and that's totally okay. So um, that said, it's, I'm making it sound light and breezy, and what's actually happening to you, it's so confusing, and it's so intense and stressful and sad, you know? So I think, um, but again, I think if you have that North Star, and you're looking out for each other, I think that's part of, and oftentimes, like, if you can ask yourself the question, like, well, what are we going to, what are, how do we avoid regret? You know, like, what's the best way we can avoid regret? But I think at the same time, it's like everybody's haunted by a decision somewhere about something, and all we can do is do our best. You know what I mean? I don't know. Well, you, you were in your 30s when all this happened. Mm -hmm. Had you ever given any thought to advanced directives or any planning or any conversation mm -hmm. about those kind of things prior to the illness? Yes, because of being doctors. Um, otherwise, I think it would have been really different. We did. We had not done that paperwork. And I was like, I was like, we no five wishes. <laughs> Although I love five wishes. I love five wishes. Um, we had. I told Paul. I was like, we need to do your advanced directive. And he was like, we need to do your advanced directive. <laughs> I was like, that is true. Um, so, uh, but I think you know that paperwork really matters because you, when you name a proxy, you know. If you don't have a proxy and you can't speak for yourself, there's an order in which stuff, like, they'll turn to your spouse, then they'll turn to your adult child, <laughs> then you'll turn, it's like, there's a legal order of who actually can make decisions for each other. But if you have set that in stone yourself, and especially if you've talked with the person, it's helpful. Um, and then uh, what that forum is doing is actually just giving the right to advocate for you that you might not want particular um, parts of medical care. It actually came out of like the patient rights and autonomy movement in like the 80s and 90s, which is like to that it is your right to refuse medical care and then it's your right to have somebody refuse it on your behalf. So partly it's just a tool um, to have your opinion expressed. Um, but I think having somebody like having somebody who knows you well 
and knows what you care about, doing that is, I think, the most, the most important part of it, you know? Um, but then I had to, I am a primary care doctor. So I had talked about that stuff with a lot of patients and encouraged people to be doing that paperwork. And I think um, there are a number of good websites and tools for it. Like Five Wishes is a really good tool. I think they um, have that pamphlet here. It's like a, it's like a little mm -hmm. worksheet. Um, and the Conversation Project is also really good. Um, and then there are some books that are really good. Like um, there's another, there's a book called The Conversation um, uh, by Angela Volandes. And there's another book called um, After the Diagnosis um, by Steve Pantelat that's just about decision-making in, in a serious illness and how to live well. Because um, if you're not a doctor and you are a a healthcare provider or um, have seen a family member go through something, so it's kind of hard to picture like what the what you're actually filling out, you know. But there's a lot of tools for figuring out what that so is. So, as a primary care physician, mm -hmm. uh, you must have a lot of younger clients, mm -hmm. clients, patients, and I, I do you encourage younger people to think about these things? Uh, I mean, it's. It's a little different conversation when I really didn't want to hear about it when I was a lot younger. I mean, it just wasn't interesting to me. I sort of had that immortality thing going on. And then as you get older, you start to have friends who become ill, and you start to think more about it. And certainly when you get to my age, you start to think about it a lot more. But I'm wondering how to um, engage some of the younger people that I know uh, in thinking about some of these things. You're very young yourself. Mm -hmm. And you and Paul, did you think about these things? I mean, how, what would your advice be around that? Um, I think the thing that's important for everybody is to have a, to know who their proxy decision maker would be and have their doctor or their hospital or whatever. They ask you that, like before you go into surgery or whatever. That's a thing. Um, I think that the people for whom advanced care planning um, is important. Um, and it, the advanced directive paperwork is a piece of that. Um, is people who are either older or who have a serious medical illness. I think that's where that's most important is to be having conversations about what medical care fits you best. And I think it's actually important whether or not somebody's going to make that decision for you. Um, in many cases, you make the decisions yourself, but um, like facing up to sort of what seems to be happening and what the risks are of everything, how to choose. Um, I think the thing that all adults should know is who their proxy decision maker would be and um, have that noted. Has, has the rise of hospice and palliative care, in your view, changed the way physicians look at, look at any of these issues? Yeah, I think definitely. I think um, for you know, for all I've said about the taboos in medical culture and everything, I think um, yeah, all that stuff is starting to blossom and change. Um, yeah, I think yes. And <laughs> what, what what I'm interested in is is that a conversation you think most physicians are willing to have? Is that a oh. is that an option that is offered in any way? I think back to when. We were fighting over medical care in the United States. And at one point in the Affordable Care Act, there was a proposal to pay doctors to have that conversation that got thrown out. Do doctors even want to have that conversation when they're not getting paid oh, for gotcha. it? Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, now it is like an actual billing code. So it, it is? Uh -huh. Yeah. I did not yeah. know that. OK. Um, that was the whole death panels thing. That was nuts. Um, so basically, it depends, I think. Um, medical schools, we were just talking about this, but medical schools are starting to train people to ask this kind of question and to, um, you know, approach, approach medical care and medical decision making in a um, really sort of humanistic way. Um, and I think in general, yeah, like people are getting trained to do that. People are realizing that it's super important. And so I think it's not like nobody's ever heard of it or nobody would know why you were asking that or just whatever. At the same time, I think um, there's all these dualities, you know, like the, um, the oncology society guidelines say 
if you have stage three or four cancer, you should have a palliative care team and an oncologist at the same time. That's like what the guidelines are for patients. It's the best care for patients. Um, but like cancer centers aren't set up where as soon as you get to them, they're saying, here's your oncologist and here's your palliative care team and everybody's gonna work together and do this well. So it's like, there's a lot of pieces that are missing or not actually happening in practice, even though we know we should be doing them. So I think we all need to be pushing each other to do them. Okay. You and Paul, as he's facing the end of his life, decided to have a baby. What was that about? <laughs> <laughs> That's what my mom said. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yes. So we had always thought we would have children around the time that Paul was finishing residency. It was like, things are going to get easier. We'll <laughs> think about doing this. And that was right when he was diagnosed um, with stage four incurable cancer. And we both sort of looked at each other like, is, I, I think when he was still in the hospital for the first time, and we were like, you know, if you're going to start chemo, we should think about this. And is this crazy? And we were like, that's kind of crazy. Um, initially, he felt more sure of it than I did. Um, so, and we had our daughter, Katie, she's now three and a half. She's like basically potty trained, not totally. <laughs> and, um, and she's really cool. And, um, and she's beautiful. I've seen a picture of her. She looks like little Indian me. She's like, so she's cool. She's got these dark eyes and giant eyelashes. Um, she's a little spitfire. And she, um, and she, um, she knows about Paul. She's really interested in Paul. Um, and I remember, so Paul writes in the book about this really pivotal conversation where, you know, we were thinking this is, let's think about this, but it, you know, like we really need a lot of family support to be able to do that. There's, when you have a child, you're introducing all this uncertainty anyway, you know, like pregnancy is nerve wracking, having an infant, so it's just like, it's all uncertainty from the moment you decide to have a child anyway, for the rest of your life. And it feels like, <laughs> and, um, uh, except for with Jan, he's good. Um, and um, I remember talking about it, and Paul wrote this down, but it's so, it was so important to me where I said, you know, we're really thinking about this, but it's introducing a, a real, um, you know, maybe it's going to take time away from me and you, obviously, and um, it, it's introducing uncertainty and pain in another way. Like, can we handle that? And and then it's, let's say it all turns out great, and then you need to say goodbye to this child. Like, how, isn't that going to make things so much more painful for you? And he, he said this amazing thing. He said, I said, wouldn't it make it more painful for you? And he said, wouldn't it be great if it did? Ah, and it just was so <laughs> helpful and beautiful. And I think about it all the time. Wouldn't it be great if it did? Is like a, ah, it was just so helpful. And it made me feel like, a, he can handle it, and B, how could you not do that in a way? Um, and I also read a really good book at the time. Have you read um, Far From the Tree by Andrew Solomon? Mm. It's awesome. It's, um, mm. it's a really deeply researched book by Andrew Solomon, um, who's an amazing writer. He's gay and dyslexic, and his mom was incredibly supportive with his learning disability and did not accept that he was gay. And so he writes about identity and the ways in which kids can be very different from their parents. And the book is set up as chapters of like epilepsy, autism, children who commit a crime, deafness, all these ways in which your, your life could be very different from your parents' life and how does that affect your interactions. And I remember reading it just to kind of get a sense of like what are you inviting when you have a child and how do you how do you understand what it means to take that on in your own life? And all the parents in the book say, I would do anything to take this pain away from my child, whatever the thing is, but it's enriched me so much that I'm a deeper, more resilient person and I would never turn the clock back on this. And I relate to that. I relate to that in marrying Paul. I would marry him again, even if I knew what was going to happen. And I don't know, I just feel like there's so many things we do in our lives that we do not because they're easy, but because they are meaningful. Um, and so anyway, that just all felt like that layers and layers of that. Um, 
Yeah. And then we just had a lot of other support, like our parents and um, kind of practical support to feel like it was possible. Um, but I'm so, I can't imagine my life without Katie now. It's like, uh, um, I feel really glad we did that. And I, it's wonderful to have this piece of Paul. And then I also have to think about her, like letting her become her person and somehow understand where she came from too, you know, like helping her develop it. It's like Paul con Paul conceived of the memoir as a way to communicate with her. He didn't write her anything separate or anything. Like it's in the book, he's saying like, it's important to try hard and I love you. Like that's what he says to her, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I'm. it was kind of crazy, but I'm really glad we did it. Well, and I think about um, the book um, on so many levels, but what you're articulating is one of those levels about um, the acceptance of suffering. Yeah. And uh, he said some amazing things like you have just told us about. And, and I think that our culture doesn't condone that mm -hmm. suffering. I mean, I, so I think he's written a meditation on suffering um, in such an eloquent way that you know, for the rest of us who struggle with that concept of, you know, what does it mean to suffer? Yeah. And certainly what that's like to come to some acceptance about that. I mean, that's one of the things about this book that I really, I could go back and read it again just for that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it was wonderful. And having Katie, I think, is sort of part of that mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. He said, a, he said that other thing where he wrote down, People often ask, like, he's uh, like, don't you ask why me? And he says, well, why not me? Yeah. So it's like, oh, that's yeah. really, sure, totally. Those moments, he, 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 you said that once Paul said to you, everything's going to be okay. And you said, I just don't know what mm -hmm. okay is. Mm -hmm. Do you have some different understanding of that now, these years later? Oh. Yeah, I remember that conversation. I mean, I don't know. I think, I think you just sort of said it, right, Elise, about um, like the meditation on suffering. I think I don't know how to sum it up. I think some of it has to do with like the understanding and coming to terms with the idea that in some way things are not going to be okay. Like that is that's true, right? It's true for everybody here. Um, and I think that's the real challenge. Um, and that's not easy. And for those of you who may be Buddhists, I think one of Buddha's four great truths is that life includes suffering. Uh, hard, hard for all of us to deal with. And, and I think you even said living fully means accepting suffering. Do you still struggle with that acceptance today? Kind of, I mean, I think everybody does, right? It's like, um, yes, but I feel like I'm at the same time, like getting better at it through a whole bunch of stuff, like support of other people and meditation and whatever. And I also feel like, you know, in a way suffering's totally hidden from us. Like we, it's, it's like, you can walk around and it's like people who are suffering or ill or dying are like really hidden. And I think that's a unique thing in our current history, right? I don't think that was true in villages and whatever, stretching back forever. It's only true now. Um, but I also think kind of like we were saying at the beginning, like your own suffering connects you to the suffering of everybody else, you know? And it's like, mm -hmm. I was, I got a, um, Somebody wrote me a letter after Paul died and they had read his book and it was a doctor on the, the Isle of Skye, is that? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and um, his wife had died of um, a form of liver cancer and he sent me a CD of this um, traditional music that they played at their wedding that he had also used in a fundraiser that they had done for the um, cancer center. And I was listening, like I was alone in our living room, so lonely after Paul died, like eight months after Paul died, listening to this music. And I was like, 
listening to the music of these other people's wedding who I have never met. And it's so beautiful. And he's been this sad. And then now I'm this sad. And I just was like, this is, this is it. Like, this is the, it was so helpful. It was like, I don't know. It was like, it, fe- it made it feel like I was not suffering alone. And, um, and that itself is really helpful. And I think, um, again, has like deepened my own relationships and deepened my understanding of sort of what we're all here to do together. Um, Lucy, my, uh, my years in television have caused me too many times to say we're about out of time. Uh, <laughs> but we're never going to cover it all. It, it is such, I have described the book to my friends as lyrical. Uh, Paul, Paul was an amazing writer, just absolutely an amazing writer, and, and such an interesting man, and uh, a lifetime isn't a given number of years, but the number of years were given, and the years you were given with him are capsulized in this book and summarized in ways that impress me very much. Is there anything else you'd like to finish with for us? Um, uh, we had talked about doing a reading or doing a little thing. Would you like to do that? It's like a total tearjerker. <laughs> um, so I just want to read the last paragraph of Paul's book, which I really love. And um, oftentimes people ask me to read it. And um, it's the little love letter that he writes to our daughter. Mm. And it's so nice. It's like my prized possession. And... Um, one thing that I, so um, there's this movie that's going to come out on Netflix sometime soon. I think it's called, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember the name. It's called Ending Well or something. It's a, B.J. Miller's in it and this other um, palliative care doctor, Steve Pantelat, is in it. And it's a little short about hospice. And Steve Pantelat, who's um, this amazing physician at UCSF, um, is quoted in the trailer. And he says, you know, people who, People who are healthy talk about how they would want to die. And people who are dying talk about how they want to live. And I was like, that makes total sense. I love it. Um, So this is like a thing that Paul wrote uh, that sort of is about that, um, what it was like to live at that time. I hope I'll live long enough that Katie has some memory of me. Words have a longevity I do not. I had thought I could leave her a series of letters, but what would they say? I don't know what this girl will be like when she's 15. I don't even know if she'll take to the nickname we've given her. There is perhaps only one thing to say to this infant who is all future, overlapping briefly with me, whose life barring the improbable is all but past. That message is simple. When you come to one of the many moments in life where you must give an account of yourself, provide a ledger of what you have been and done and meant to the world, Do not, I pray, discount that you filled a dying man's days with a sated joy, a joy unknown to me in all my prior years, a joy that does not hunger for more and more, but rests satisfied. In this time, right now, that is an enormous thing. What a lovely gift. Wow. What a lovely gift. And... While we were sitting here talking, Barbara Bush has passed. Oh, Oh. wow. I had the pleasure to meet her a couple different times. A lovely woman. And uh, so, apropos to the conversation we're having, that she chose in her last moments, fine comfort. I wish the same for all of you, and thank you, Lucy, for everything you've done for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.